All right, good afternoon. This is gonna be a packed room, so unfortunately we just have to make best of what we got. I suppose there's standing room over here for one, but uh, we'll do what we can. But at any rate, uh, welcome all. Uh, I am Peter Russo, I'm the Director of Congressional Affairs at the Cato Institute, and I wanna thank you all for coming today. Uh, this is a Capitol Hill briefing entitled The National Flood Insurance Program, Zoning Regulations and Hurricanes, Lessons for Lawmakers. Uh, first, I have some uh, housekeeping stuff, but if you're watching via our live stream, and would like to join the conversation, we'd love to hear from you, so please tweet comments and questions to us at hashtag Cato events. And also for the first time on the Hill, we will be accepting questions from Facebook Live, so if you're watching <laughs> there, you may post there as well. Um, this spring, the Cato Institute released the eighth edition of the Cato Handbook for Policymakers. Uh, there were copies available on the table as you came in. And though we don't have a chapter on the NFIP, we do have questions, chapters on environmental policy and climate change. Uh, there's also a chapter entitled Housing and Urban Development, which would expand our views on these types of regulation even further than we have time to do so today. Um, and if you'd like more copies, please contact me after the program. And meanwhile, fully searchable PDFs of the entire 80 chapter book are available at Cato.org. Um, as everyone knows, we are enjoying a slight reprieve. So originally authorization of the NFIP was to occur in about five days. But the, in the interim, that deadline has been extended to December 8th, so we have plenty of time to think or rethink about this. Um, outright repeal, the ideal end result for us is unlikely at either date. And though there is a widespread acknowledgement that the program cannot go on as it is currently constructed, uh, we note that there are already a number of excellent reform options being considered that could provide an exit ramp for a future repeal. Uh, this then is a forum to highlight our own views on the program as well as to tackle a pair of important issues relevant to the discussion. The first on the nature of climate change and its effects on storm strength and frequency and two on how state and local regulations contribute to a locality's vulnerabilities, as well as to its ability to recover from storm and flood-related damage. On to the panel, Ike Brannon is a visiting fellow at the Cato Institute who specializes in fiscal policy, tax reform, and regulatory issues. A well-known figure in Washington economic circles, this Indiana University-trained economist served for a number of congressional committees on both sides of the Capitol, as well as a senior economist in the executive branch for the Office of Management and Budget. His work has appeared in the Weekly Standard, the Financial Times, Time.com, and many others. Some of his work is in your laps. If uh, you do not get it, I can get you more. Um, second, Ryan Maui is a research meteorologist and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. He has developed and maintained a popular weather maps and climate data service based on the world's best numerical weather prediction systems. After earning his PhD in 2010, Maui was awarded a National Research Council postdoctoral associateship at the Naval Research Lab in beautiful Monterey, California, where I have many family, uh, where he focused on global weather prediction and verification. And with the growth of Twitter and its image posting function, Maui's weather maps and expert commentary are widely seen in social media, as well as quoted in mainstream outlets, and his recent coverage of Harvey and Irma were not to be missed. Uh, R.J. Lehman is Editor-in-Chief and Senior Fellow of the R Street Institute, responsible for managing all the Institute's editorial and communications functions. He, is, he also is author of numerous R Street policy studies, including the 2012 to 2016 editions of the Flagship Insurance Regulation Report Card. R.J. was a co-founder of R Street in June 2012, having previously served as Deputy Director of the Heartland Institute Center on Finance, Insurance, and Real Estate. Before joining Heartland, he spent nearly a decade covering the insurance and financial services industries, first as manager of a Washington Bureau of AM Best Company and later as a senior industry editor. Um, Vanessa Brown Calder is a policy analyst at the Cato Institute where she focuses on social welfare, housing, and urban policy. She holds a master's degree in public policy from Harvard Kennedy School and has published articles for Investors Business Daily, CNN.com, The Washington Examiner, National Review Online, and the Kennedy School Review. Previously, Calder worked as a graduate fellow in welfare studies at the Heritage Foundation, where she analyzed the low-income housing tax credit in Chicago's housing voucher, voucher program. So with that, we're gonna let Ike uh, lead us off, and you can do it from here. So let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, uh, Peter, thanks for the, uh, for the intro. Um, uh, 20 years ago, one of my side gigs was advising a band that was uh, up and coming, and one of the first rules I remember is you put them in a room that doesn't quite fit, rather than a room that's half the size that they'll, they'll fit. So, um, well played, Peter, well played. It's <laughs> um, the best we could do, I'm afraid. So, besides the, uh, the, the Cato Handbook that has some broad stuff about the flood insurance, um, 
Uh, me and myself and Ari Blask uh, did a uh, policy analysis that came out uh, fortuitously sometime in uh, mid-July that looked a little bit uh, in greater depth at the problem that we have with, uh, with flood insurance. Let me just talk briefly about it and then I'll uh, cede the mic to R.J. Lehman who spent uh, the last decade thinking about this uh, night and day. Uh, quite literally because uh, he almost got flooded out in Hurricane uh, Irma, so um, maybe he can tell us a little bit about his evacuation. <laughs> um, so, um, look, almost 50 years ago, uh, Congress, for various reasons, decided to uh, federalize the National Flood Insurance Program. And the main reason is that people objected to paying what was the market price for flood insurance. Um, when the government came in and said, we're going to pay what, what is deemed a fair price, and they didn't worry about making a profit or uh, setting aside a loss reserve, it created a dramatic moral hazard problem that contributed to the massive expansion and development in floodplain areas, like uh, such as Miami Beach and uh, all along the uh, Atlantic uh, Southeast Coast. And uh, it was this moral hazard problem that has really created potential for tens of, if not hundreds of billions of dollars in uh, damages if we have a serious hurricane that, that goes that way. Um, it's also, I think, somewhat to blame for what's going on in Houston. Most people, as you know, did not have flood insurance because they were outside the 100-year the plane. I think it's worth asking, and we did in our report, what the insurance, property and casual insurance market would look like if we didn't have the federal government coming in and carving out one little niche and, and providing that uh, by itself. I, I wager that um, we would have an insurance market that would look radically different and people would get, as a matter of course, some kind of flood insurance no matter where they lived, uh, paying a, a moderate degree more. That I think would certainly be a much more efficient answer than what we currently have at stake. Um, I don't want to steal RJ's thunder, but um, there is some uh, private insurance, private flood insurance out there. Um, I think uh, Congressman Henserling's uh, idea in the bills that he's proposed related to flood insurance would do a little bit more, if not a lot more, to that end. And uh, I'm happy that there is some kind of debate going on in Congress right now to fix a problem that I think the last two hurricanes will uh, painfully illustrate is a gigantic problem, right? The current debt uh, of the National Flood Insurance Program is $25 billion, and that is, I'm sure, only going to go up here in the next six months as we do a a full attribution of, of the cost there. And that's not to mention all those people who probably aren't going to be bailed out all that much from uh, FEMA based on the damage that they had in Houston. So, um, okay, that's, that's all from my part. I want to introduce uh, my good friend uh, uh, RJ, who's been working on this for a long time. And uh, please do tell us a little bit about your uh, escape from sure. uh, the hurricane. Uh, well, so I, I wasn't almost flooded. I was, I'll, I'll leave, at least my home was not almost flooded. I live in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, which did get uh, some damage, not nearly as badly as, as it had initially been feared. Uh, and we escaped uh, uh, on the last day to Jacksonville, Florida, which actually got significantly more damage than the place <laughs> I escaped from, well uh, which is uh, generally inevitable if you speak to any Floridian. They have all had this experience at some point of evacuating to where the storm ends up going. Um, in this case, the storm was on the west coast. The flooding uh, was pretty significant on the east coast. I can actually provide just a start where, where we are with the most recent storms. Uh, as, I, as Ike mentioned, the NFIP is about $25 billion in debt, $24.6 billion in debt to the federal treasury. Uh, it can, under current law, borrow up to $30.4 to $6 billion. Um, so, uh, the estimate on Harvey is that that will be about an $11 billion event. Um, the NFIP has about a billion dollars in cash, and it has a billion dollars in reinsurance, uh, which this is the first year it's ever had reinsurance. That is something that came out of the 2012 Bigger Waters Bill, the last time we seriously debated flood insurance in Congress. Um, it bought it this year, uh, placed for $150 million dollars, $1 billion in private reinsurance. It will pay out all of that, so that was a pretty good investment, and it'll save the taxpayers about $850 million this year. Uh, the, the subscription was, was 20 times oversubscribed, so it, it actually, they could have ceded a lot more to the private market. Uh, there, was, there was big interest for, in the private reinsurance market. So anyway, uh, Harvey looks like it's gonna be about a, in terms of private insurance, about a $21 billion insurance event, Irma, probably at least 40 billion, uh, which puts it in the range of Katrina. The flood claims will be more, 
from Harvey. The wind claims will be more from Irma. Uh, and then we have uh, Maria now, um, it, it, although it, it may not make a US landfall, uh, uh, at least mainland landfall, Puerto Rico uh, and the Virgin Islands both participate in the NFIP as well. Uh, Puerto Rico has about $900 million of insured exposure and the Virgin Islands have about $280 million. They were both uh, significantly hit by, in some cases, all three of these storms. Um, and so there, there will be significant claims coming out of there as well. So uh, the NFIP will soon have to ask Congress to borrow more money. Uh, it, it is uncertain how much more, but probably we can anticipate that it's going to it's going to ask for at least another $10 billion in borrowing, which would bring its total debt to the federal taxpayers to $40 billion, um, which is significant. Uh, in terms of reforms, currently on the table uh, in the House, there, there are a number of bills that passed through the House Financial Services Committee in June. I was here and, and testified on those. Um, none have moved to the floor yet. Uh, the most significant of these uh, from our perspective is what's called the Flood Insurance uh, Market Parity and Modernization Act. And it would allow uh, a greater access to private insurers to the, to the flood insurance market. There is uh, a small but growing private flood insurance market. Um, uh, according to S&P Global, it's about, in 2016, it was about $600 million in premiums. Uh, the flood insurance program itself collects $3.3 so it's, it's not enough to cover everyone, but uh, if it continues on this pace, it, it could get a significant number of people within not too many years. In fact, there's been uh, some reports from, from Milliman, which is a, a respected actuary, and they show in states like Florida, Louisiana, Texas, which were all states that were hit in these recent storms and are the major constituents of the flood insurance program, um, even in the highest risk zones, a majority of policyholders could get uh, better coverage, cheaper coverage from the private market than they do from the NFIP. Um, so why doesn't that happen already? There, there's, a few, uh, there's a few obstacles that, that remain. The, the one that the Market Parity Act would, would fix uh, is that currently lenders remain a little bit uh, hesitant to accept private flood insurance for the mandate that mortgages for properties that exist in, in, in 100 year floodplains, um, uh, they are, the, the lenders are accustomed to dealing with the NFIP. They know that NFIP coverage fulfills the mandate. Private flood insurance will not exactly replicate the NFIP. Private insurers will come up with their own plans. They'll have different deductibles, they'll have different uh, coverages. Some may cover things the NFIP does not currently cover. The NFIP doesn't cover finished basements. It doesn't cover uh, additional living expenses. Uh, on property, uh, on commercial property insurance, it doesn't cover com uh, business interruption. So those are all things that you would expect the private market might offer that the NFIP does not. It might have different deductibles. They might have different co-payments. Um, who decides what is acceptable coverage right now? It should be on the, the banking regulators, but they have been slow. Uh, five years slow at this point in coming up with rules. Uh, so this would essentially leave it to the state insurance regulators who currently uh, are in charge of private flood insurance to verify that this coverage is comparable, uh, that coverage provided by a private company is comparable and that that would satisfy the lending requirements. Um, there are other changes that are made in that, in that as well, dealing with if you leave, if you're in a subsidized property and you leave the NFIP and then come back to the NFIP, do you lose your subsidy altogether? This would uh, say you do not, not a piece that I particularly <laughs> appreciate, but it, but it does at least encourage people who might otherwise be hesitant to leave the program to stay within the program. Um, some other uh, challenges that remain for the private market uh, the first is that currently uh, there are about 70 insurers that are paid by the NFIP to write uh, and to adjust <coughs> NFIP policies. Uh, if you participate in that program, it's called the Write Your Own Program, you are barred from selling private flood insurance. Uh, this would remove that uh, conflict of interest requirement. Um, and that, that might actually bring some more into the program. In fact, just a couple days ago, the CEO of Allstate said if if these 
changes come through, they would consider writing private insurance, which would, they're the second largest home insurer in the country. It would be a significant change if they were to enter this market in a big way. Um, and, and then the final uh, challenge that remains is that data on flood claims in the past uh, is something that, the, that FEMA has still kept kind of close to the, close to the chest. Uh, private insurers and private reinsurers would like access to that data so that they can begin to write policies. Uh, they, you would expect that they would write them. There would be more variation and bespoke coverage than in there is currently. There's essentially three major risk zones that FEMA puts people into. Uh, does not make much distinction at the property level between people in those zones. Uh, and, and if insurers had access to that data, uh, they would probably come along much more quickly in being able to write private coverage. Um, that bill currently uh, is being attached in the House to the FAA renewal. Um, it may pass as early as tonight. Uh, there is, we have heard, reports that there's some pushback on the Democratic side to including it in the FAA bill. And even if it does get through the House, we have a bigger challenge in the Senate uh, and that the FAA bill in particular would have to pass through UC through unanimous consent. It would take just one objection to, to doom that. And there have been a few um, uh, Democratic senators, uh, notably Sherrod Brown, who's the ranking member in the banking committee, uh, who do not uh, like this particular provision. Uh, they raise concerns that insurers would come and cherry pick the NFIP, take away the best policies and, and leave the worst in the government program. Uh, what we would say to that is uh, cherry picking is, is difficult to do when you already have a what is a high risk pool. The NFIP by itself is a high risk pool. Um, it does not pay enough as seen by its debt, as seen by uh, its actuarial profile. It, it does not collect enough in premiums to be sustainable. Every policy that you take out of the NFIP from the perspective of taxpayers is a net plus. Anything that you can move to the private market is a net plus. Um, it is true that some are more deficient than others, right? And, and that needs to be corrected whether you have more or less private and flood insurance. That allowing private flood insurance to take a bigger stake of the market has no bearing on the fact that eventually it is simply unsustainable uh, to continue to uh, provide uh, subsidized uh, coverage in this way. Um, and specifically, the subsidies go overwhelmingly to coastal residents. It is 85%, uh, there's only 3% of the policies are in what is called the V zone, that is zones that uh, experience coastal surge. 85% of those policies are subsidized. If you were to take simply the inland counties of the United States, the NFIP actually it pr produces a net profit. Um, but the, once you take into account all of, the, all of the coastal counties, they by themselves, uh, that those policies lose $1.5 billion a year, which is why it's an unsustainable program. We are giving in, encouragement for continued development and, and along the coast, irrespective of one's position on, t on climate change. Uh, if, if seas don't rise, if the climate doesn't change, we are still moving more and more people to the coast and it is explicit government policy to encourage that and that is why we continue to have higher and higher losses. If you do have fears about climate change, my organization is one that does accept the, uh, that climate change is real and largely man-made and is a problem, uh, then that only compounds the problem. So anyway, that, that's more or less the state of play as we see it uh, today. Hey, RJ, thank you so much. Uh, Vanessa? Uh, we go to Ryan first? We'll go to, oh, sure. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so Hurricane Harvey was the first major hurricane in 12 years to hit the United States coastline. It landed as a Cat 4 um, in Rockport, Texas uh, on August 25th. The previous major hurricane was Wilma back in 2005. So there's a little bit of hurricane amnesia. Uh, and then obviously with Irma in Florida and the mass evacuation that uh, uh, that sort of confirmed what didn't happen with Matthew the previous year. So according to many uh, observations, it was probably the wettest tropical cyclone on record over a U.S. location. Uh, many areas around Houston received over 40 inches of rain. Uh, 
And I was calculating for many media news outfits how many trillions of gallons had fallen. It's a totally inane statistic, but it gives you a way to like visualize actually how much rain had fallen in Texas. It was honestly right around 20 trillion gallons of water, which if you compare it to the national debt, is about the same. <laughs> um, so this is an example of a rapidly intensifying hurricane. So it was a tropical wave as it was moving through the Caribbean. And as it reached the Yucatan Peninsula, sort of broke up, became disorganized. But the moment it actually entered the Gulf of Mexico, it rapidly blew up into a category three and then made landfall as a four. Had the storm had a little bit more time, it would have definitely been a five at landfall. So Harvey was an example of a hurricane that was actually well forecast, well predicted, and uh, ran out of time as it was making landfall, thankfully. So the wind damage around Rockport and the surge was considerable, but the main event was the rainfall. The rainfall in Houston, Harris County, and the metro area, Galveston, was extreme. So we were watching the radar uh, overnight, and then for the next several days, as rain bands were training on, on the coastline and inundating with rainfall rates three, four, five inches an hour. Um, so it was the post-landfall track, the stalling of the system, over land. So the this, this center actually moved inland a matter of miles, remained sort of in a loopy, meandering pattern, and then caused just enormous rainfall. And that was sort of an inland flood event. So the surge was not an issue really for Houston. It was the rain coming out of the sky that was causing the flood. And in the, in the case of 20 to 40 inches, and there was some observations of over 60 inches of rain. So it was in, in that respect, it's a little bit different threat than you typically see with a hurricane. So Hurricane Irma was a very large storm. Um, many folks in Florida evacuated from the eastern side of the state in southeast Florida to the western part of the state. And then they moved up to Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville. And many moved up to Atlanta, where I live. And I had, my power was knocked out for two days. So this was like a huge inland wind event. And actually, the rainfall wasn't that, that big of an issue. Um, the flash flood emergencies that occurred in Houston uh, were ex uh, extremely uh, dangerous compared to anything Irma provided. So in that case, you sort of have two different systems, but they're still in the Gulf of Mexico. You have Hurricane Harvey, which was a rapidly intensifying Cat 4 as it made landfall, and then you have Hurricane Irma, which was more of a weakening Cat 3. Now, watching the, the hurricane models and the spaghetti um, I was actually pretty fearful that Irma was going to be a Cat 5 into Miami. The Hurricane Center had the track uh, with the surge and everything bullseye right onto southeast uh, Florida. Eventually the track shifted to the west slightly and then each successive forecast every 6-12 hours the hurricane cone shifted west. And then actually Hurricane Irma at Category 5 hit Cuba and got stuck on Cuba and weaken the storm. So that's sort of a characteristic of Gulf of Mexico storms. You have some that rapidly intensify and move inland, and then you have some that sort of weaken their way on land. Uh, they combine with the vertical wind shear, and they uh, actually end up being weaker but larger. So you have two different threats there from two different systems, and you had them in the same year. Um, now obviously the problem with Houston is that it's in a Gulf coastal plain, clay soil, uh, you have poor drainage, it's had repeated fund flooding since it's been founded in 1836, and it's no stranger to tropical systems. Uh, some of the um, previous ones were Hurricane Ike in 2008. That was the last Texas hurricane. No, no <laughs> Hurricane Brett in 99, if you remember, that was the last Texas major, and it was, Harvey was the strongest since Carlin in 1961. Um, some other, I guess, cool facts. Um, Wilma was the last major to hit landfall in the United States. In 2005, Charlie was the last Cat 4, and Andrew in 1992 was the last Cat 5. So after the 2005 season, there was an extreme um, fear that the hurricane season had, like 2004 and 5, had become the new normal, and that uh, we were going to see seasons with Katrina, Rita, Wilma, uh, Ivan, Dennis, we were going to see those for the next decade or 20 years. Obviously, that did not occur, but at the time, researchers, uh, with the tools they had available in the models, were being asked by insurance companies, sitting down in rooms like this, 
but given a time limit to say we need to come up with information about what you expect is going to happen for the next five to ten years in terms of hurricane activity in the Atlantic in order to write our catastrophe models. What are we going to charge? What are we going to charge the rate payers of Florida? And the numbers that they came up with, whatever they were, were based upon the best possible science at the time. And that science at the time was based on very high profile papers written by a couple, uh, actually several prominent tropical meteorologists. And they had suspected that what we were seeing was a global warming signal that hurricanes, Rita, Katrina, the seasons of 04 and 05, were an example of what climate change was occurring at that time. And that this was going to trend upwards as sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic increased, you were going to see a similar trend increase as well. Okay, so I'll leave you with that right there. Uh, and get back to what we now know as the science. What has happened in the intervening 10 to 12 years? Well, as I mentioned, there weren't any major hurricanes in the Atlantic. We sort of went into a quiet period. Um, this year is an obviously an example of a not so quiet year. And if you, would, if you were watching the seasonal forecasts from NOAA and all the private outfits that produced them, you should have been surprised that this year was an active hurricane season. Uh, there was the anticipation of a strong El Nino way back in the winter. Well, seasonal forecasts for El Nino or La Nina aren't very good. They can't get past the so-called spring barrier. So anytime you make a forecast before the spring, you're probably not gonna do so well in the summer and fall. So what we actually now have is sort of a developing neutral into a La Nina. And La Nina in the Atlantic historically is very favorable for hurricane development. You just need to have something to give you a boost in the Atlantic. The water is always warm enough for a major hurricane over the Caribbean, the Gulf, and most of the Atlantic. But if you have vertical wind shear, or if you have uh, Saharan dust, or you have anything else that's sort of a break on development, the Atlantic shuts down. Uh, it's hard to get a storm, it's hard to keep it at major intensity, and it's then therefore harder to make a, a storm make landfall. That's great. We don't want storms to be making landfall. We don't want rapid intensification near land like with Hardy. We want, honestly, we want more like Irma. Irma where they plot into making landfall. Um, Katrina was another example of a storm that like Irma was actually weakening when it made landfall. But the problem with Katrina is that it had all this surge built up at category five levels over the open gulf. So along the coast of the gulf, you have shallower water. It's not as deep, it's not as warm. So as the storm approaches, the wind field actually mixes that shelf and then it brings up the colder water from below and then pushes it on uh, closer to shore and that actually weakens the system as it moves on shore in that respect. Harvey was an example of that not happening. It was moving quite quickly to the west and rapidly developing. So the question would be is like, what are we going to get more of in the future? What types of storms are we going to, get to see more of? Are we going to see more intense, more frequent hurricanes? And the current state of the science, uh, it's probably best uh, example is by a NOAA GFDL geophysical uh, research lab at Princeton. And they update sort of a consensus online of what they expect hurricane activity to be over the next century. So we sort of have an idea of what has happened over the last century. You know, hurricane seasons in the 30s and 50s and 60s were no picnics. I mean, we have many historical storms that are benchmarks over many locations that if they reoccur today would wipe out cities and cause upwards of a trillion dollars in damage. So Irma was potentially one of those, you know, half trillion dollar storms. However, the track moved 20 miles east-west. That's our margin of error when it comes to forecasting. But it's also the margin of error when it comes to damages and what your impacts will be. So the, the NOAA GFDL consensus, as it's called. So this is what the scientists came up with after the 10 to 12 years of study since the 2005 seasons, is that climate change has not necessarily uh, had a detectable impact what we can see in the hurricane records. Doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that our observations, when you see the when you see the wind speed reported on the Weather Channel, the Hurricane Center, and they say the storm is 115 miles an hour, historically there's about a plus or minus five error on that. So the signal that we're looking for in terms of climate change is on that order. So it's right now it's hidden in the noise. Um, that doesn't mean it's not there, but there's also other things going on. Uh, aerosols, uh, the impacts of the Clean Air Act. Uh, changes 
elsewhere going on globally uh, impact hurricane activity in the Atlantic. The Atlantic, as I mentioned, is sort of like this special basin. Uh, anything that you can tip it one direction or the other can definitely change uh, the activity. So by 2100, so we're talking about the next century, uh, hurricanes on average are going to become about 2 to 11 percent more intense. That's sort of like the average of what climate, change, climate models have been saying. And we're always running new models, coming up with new numbers. But it's on the order of, let's say, 2 to 11 percent. So we're talking about you know, a few miles per hour added on to the current most intense storms. So that's, let's say that's the difference between a Cat 4 and a Cat 5. That's enormous big difference for destruction along the coastline. We don't want any more Cat 5s and we don't want anything added on to a Cat 5. Um, I think one of the more firmer changes that we see in the climate models, if all else is equal, is that the hydrological cycle is enhanced considerably by hurricanes, hurricane, or by global warming, uh, especially with hurricanes. Hurricanes are heat engines. They take the evaporation off the Earth's oceans, they spin it up, put the air in the, um, uh, updraft the air and deposit it elsewhere, and the whole time they're depositing rain. These are going to become more efficient. Uh, the atmosphere is going to be warmer. So we're going to have higher rainfall rates near the center. And that signal, can we detect that yet? Well, that's a good question for climate modeling and what's called attribution studies. So we're going to be seeing a lot more of this over the next, you know, several years. There are these attribution studies. Where there's a weather event, it could be Hurricane Harvey, it could be uh, the flood in Louisiana last year, it could be what was associated with Hurricane Joaquin in 2015. You will always see it's this framed in this way. Climate change, of course, didn't cause the event. Climate change doesn't cause hurricanes, but it made it worse. So the question is, how, how much worse? You know, what percent difference? How many inches of rain did that add? What percent, you know, how many gallons of water? And these are questions that are extremely important for catastrophe modeling, and they're also highly uncertain, because you have to make subjective choices about how you run the model, and you have to rely on your model skill not only to reproduce the event currently, you have to compare it to previous events, and you have to run it in what-if mode to remove certain, you know, determine the sensitivity to these events. Um, that's, I think, what we're going to be seeing over the next several years, and the insurance companies and, um, and scientists are very keen to understand the impacts of climate change on individual events, as uh, Hurricane Harvey demonstrated. So I think we'll see a study like that in probably the next six months or so through the peer-reviewed literature, and uh, they'll give us a number, and we'll wait for the next storm, and we'll wait for the next season. And then this will continue on as extreme events unfold, whether there's climate change or not. Uh, as I say, uh, Mother Nature and weather really wants to kill you. It really wants to, if you stay outside in a, in a hurricane or a storm, um, there's, uh, you're, you're not going to survive. <laughs> <laughs> That's a meteorologist saying that. So listen to your meteorologist. Uh, on that cheerful note, <laughs> uh, Vanessa. Can we slip in a traffic update here? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be kind of the odd duck here, and I have slides. Since it's so warm in the room, I thought pretty pictures might help. So, or not pretty. Um, okay, so we're going to take a little de detour from climate and from flood insurance to talk about zoning regulations. Um, just to get make sure that we're all on the same page here, um, I think we should define what zoning regulations are up front. So if you have ever tried to remodel a home, if you own a piece of property, then you're probably very familiar with your city's zoning code, which is where all of the zoning regulations lie. And these things determine all sorts of things about how you can develop things, uh, buildings, and where you can develop those buildings. Um, they tell you the number of floors that you're able to, or the height of the building, um, the design or architectural features that are allowed or that are prohibited, the landscaping features that are required or prohibited, um, and they can really get into the minutia. So that's what zoning regulations are and what they do, and they really do influence 
all of our experiences in what urban planners call the built environment every day. So as you're going about your daily life, you are sort of dealing with zoning regulations um, in the built environment and sort of what you see there, whether you know it or not. So why do zoning regulations matter? In the context of Hurricane Harvey, which is what I'm focusing my remarks on, a lot of the chatter that occurred after Hurricane Harvey was around how um, Houston's lack of zoning regulations, or really just a lack of a traditional zoning code, had exacerbated some of the flood damage that you saw there with Hurricane Harvey. And you can see some of the headlines here on this slide, but people were talking about this on the television as well and saying that, you know, because, because Houston had this lack of zoning, it had allowed Houston's developers to build in irresponsible ways, basically replacing absorbent green space in the city with roads and with asphalt, things that do not absorb water. And that claim really intrigued me, partially because I cover zoning regulations um, and kind of I have an urban planning background, and also because I've lived in Houston before, and that was not actually my experience having lived there, is that there was a lack of green space in the city. In fact, there are quite a few parks and quite a few trees. So I thought that I would look into it a little bit. So today I'm just gonna share some of my own analysis with you. So the first thing that I pulled up was this map here, which is actually um, the Houston-Galveston Area Council's um, Houston Urban Houston Framework. It's part of that document. And this map shows the areas in Houston which are covered with low levels of pavement, medium or average levels of pavement, and high levels of pavement. And as you can see, the light gray actually represents the low level of pavement areas. And that is probably, I don't know, 90 to 93% of the city is covered in those areas, which would say that there's actually quite a bit of green space. The medium gray represent areas that fall under the average impervious surface category, where impervious, impervious surfaces are things like roads and buildings and asphalt. So they have an average amount of those as compared with green space. And there are a few of those, maybe 5% of the map or 5 to 7% of the map. And then the dark black dots are the areas that have high levels of pavement. And you can barely even find those. None of this really matters unless you actually compare it with other cities. Um, other cities that are approximately the same size or other cities that are in active hurricane zones and that do have traditional zoning regulations. So I went ahead and found some USDA Forest Service data, and this is the table that I compiled based on that data. I aggregated the data into two categories. One is the um, areas of these cities that are covered by impervious surfaces, covered by buildings and roads and parking lots and sidewalks, and the other is a category which is the absorbent surface cover in those cities. And as you can see, Houston does better than any of the comparably sized or comparably, comparably risky from a hurricane perspective um, cities, including New Orleans, Miami, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York. Houston has 61% of its land is covered with absorbent surface cover. Um, so vegetation and soil and things like that, and 40% is covered with impervious surfaces. So I thought that that was pretty interesting. So there are a few facts about Houston which I think are actually even more relevant than whether or not it has zoning regulations, and I know that some of these were probably mentioned by other panelists or alluded to, but Houston is number one in the Gulf of Mexico, number two, it's in an active hurricane zone. Topographically, Houston is a very flat place. Um, just to give you a sense for that, downtown Houston uh, is at 50 feet above sea level. Yeah, it's, it's, it's at 50 feet above sea level, and there's only about a four foot change in elevation in downtown Houston from the highest point to the lowest point. So there's not a lot of place for water to go, or not an obvious place for that water to go when it falls down on the city. It just can't run off very well because there's not a lot of slope or incline to kind of tell it where to run off to. It's, Houston is also built on clay soil, which is different from other, um, other cities in active hurricane zones, like Miami, for instance. 
Clay soil is not particularly permeable, as you're probably all aware. Um, it doesn't do very well with absorbing water. And finally, Houston had 50 inches of rainfall within about three days, as you've all heard. Um, that is, to give you some context, more than Seattle, Washington receives in an entire year. And Seattle, Washington is a very rainy place. So I think it's probably safe to say that the common sense takeaway would have nothing to do with zoning regulations and a lot more to do with just sort of the fundamentals of where Houston is located and the amount of tropical storm that Houston was subjected to. I think there is probably a conversation to be had here about whether or not it makes sense to build cities in locations that have these different characteristics, but that is a different question than once you build that city, should you separate land uses in the way that a traditional zoning code allows you to do? Okay, so I wanted to end on sort of a optimistic, positive <coughs> note, unlike Ryan. I'm just kidding. Um, so I think that actually there's a good argument to be made and one that I didn't see in the commentary swirling around Houston and Hurricane Harvey, that actually Houston will do much better in the aftermath of the hurricane based on its lack of zoning. And the reason for that is that a lack of zoning means often a lack of bureaucracy, a lack of waiting time as you're trying to get your development permitted, and an ability to move quickly through the development process. Um, if any of you live in DC and have ever tried to remodel a home here, you know just how much uncertainty can be baked into your development process when you try to do that. You don't know exactly when the permits will come through. There's a lot of waiting and guessing along the way. That uncertainty is actually removed to some degree from the development process in Houston, or at least it's abbreviated. Um, zoning regulations have also been used in other storms as kind of a political weapon, you could say. They've been used in rather unsavory ways a lot of times. If you think about Hurricane Katrina, um, the parishes surrounding New Orleans actually used zoning, the zone, their zoning codes in order to block development or to put moratoriums on apartment building in their parishes or to shut down the ability of um, homeowners to actually rent to people that were not their blood relatives, which really sounds really out there. But it made it hard for those parishes and for New Orleans to absorb these displaced people as a result of Hurricane Katrina. Um, that won't occur in Houston either. So that's all good news. That's good news, I think, every day, but especially good news in the case of a natural disaster. So I'll leave you on that um, rather positive note, and I guess we'll be moving to questions here soon. I'm going to uh, thank you very much, Vanessa. I'm going to ask the first question or two, and then we'll, uh, we'll get going. So, hey, Ryan, I just want to ask you a quick question. So um, at the end, you talked about the strength of um, hurricanes, and it, it's tied to climate, uh, possible ties to climate change. Um, would that also make, um, so if, if the 2 to 11 percent increase in intensity, does that also widen how uh, a hurricane as well? I mean, what I'm not quite sure what intensity is other than higher wind and more rain. Yeah, in general, the the modeling for the changes in the size of the storm is a little less certain. Um, it's, it's hard to determine because our historical records of storm size is, uh, it, it's uncertain, I guess, that, that's the word that we keep saying and, and I keep using, is that prior to the 1970s, we didn't have satellite coverage and we didn't have uh, uh, aircraft coverage until after the 1940s. Uh, and then some basins weren't covered. So in order to determine like what is the change, you have to have the, the numerator and the denominator. And sometimes we don't know either very well. And I say over the next century, you could expect a more intense storm you know, on the order of uh, a few percent. Um, but to know whether it's going to be a larger storm or a more compact storm is hard to say. The example you could look at right now is uh, Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Lee out in the Atlantic right now. Maria, it was a monstrous storm. It's still out there as a, as a hurricane. Lee actually developed further out in the Atlantic as a, type, a, a, a tiny microcane. You could actually take the center of Lee and put it inside Maria, mm -hmm. and you couldn't really tell the difference. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so you get this different populations of types of storms. And the idea was that you know, as the environmental conditions change to make it more favorable in the Atlantic for more intense storms, we're probably going to see larger storms. But if those shift to higher latitudes, uh, that may not necessarily be the case. So the best way, I think, to focus on is to say, what, do, what would you expect in an enclosed basin like the Gulf of Mexico, where you're going to have a landfall? Uh, there's no, no, it, the storm is probably not going to die out in the middle of the, uh, the Gulf in September. And you can have many different systems. You can have like Katrina and Rita versus Harvey and, and, and Charlie. In the end, they still all do damage wherever they make landfall. And I think that's the key of the tropical systems for wind damage is that most of the strongest winds are very near the center, whether it's a big storm or a small storm. What you see with the larger storms is the expanded wind field of tropical storm force winds, where Irma traveled up the entire peninsula of Florida into southern Georgia and it knocked out power from here in Atlanta. Those winds were on the order of 40 to 60 miles per hour with higher gusts. That was enough to wipe out trees in all the very tree-loving areas of Florida, especially Tallahassee and southern Georgia and Macon. And, that, and that's related to the precipitation as well, right? Yeah. Because the, the ground gets soft, the more rain you have, the, then it takes a, a lesser wind to knock them, knock them down. Right, so that, that's the issue with power being out. So if you have power outages, that makes life extremely miserable in the southeast, and that's a, a human mortality issue. Um, whenever you have power out in South Florida, obviously the, the nursing home uh, that was without power for several days. And the catastrophe in Puerto Rico is, is compounded that the power grid is gone. And living anywhere in the tropics where you don't have air conditioning is an extremely compounding problem that you know, need to have air conditioning. And as, as the planet warms even slightly, um, the human's capacity to deal with heat at higher and higher levels in the tropics is, is, is dif definitely more difficult. Um, and you know, a day like today in, in, in DC without air conditioning is, is no picnic. And you add in no power, no food, no electricity, and your city like Houston could be submerged in, you know, I think the numbers were 20 to 30% of the city was is submerged. Mm -hmm. um, unless you have a boat, uh, you're probably not getting around and you're not getting supplies. You will need to evacuate. And in the case of the current climate, there's many storms in the previous 50 to 100 years that if you repeated them today in some of the major cities would be complete catastrophes. And Harvey, if it had moved a little bit further to the north, would have been surged right into Houston. And instead of having 40 inches of rainfall, it would have been 10 to 15 feet of surge. Same with Irma. So in the case of different storms, uh, really, I hate using the phrase and seeing the phrase, we dodged a bullet. But in, in almost all hurricanes, it could be worse. Mm -hmm. And we have to prepare for that worst. Mm -hmm. And forecasters, like myself and the Hurricane Center, um, are always concerned about the public's amnesia and capacity to evacuate mm -hmm. and ability to take these situations seriously. Now, putting climate change fears on top of that is, in a way, counterproductive because as I wrote in the Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed, that hyping these storms, and in the case then where they don't occur, then that takes trust from the public away from scientists and forecasters and uh, not a climate but meteorologists, and they tend not to then believe when the hurricane tells you, the hurricane center tells you you need to evacuate for a Category Five, you will die. Mm -hmm. And people are like, you know what, the last time they told me that and climate change is going to make it worse, I mean, it was nothing. We left for no reason. Mm -hmm. You know, or we evacuated to Orlando and the storm was worse there. Mm -hmm. So we still have these levels of uncertainty. We don't know, uh, we can't forecast to within, you know, 10 miles of where a storm is going to make impact. And the rain bands over Houston, I think, it exemplify that. The storm was well south. It had already fizzled out away down from a, a hurricane. And it was now a tropical storm, yet it was raining like crazy. Um, similar to what tropical storm Allison was. So it was a weak system. And uh, in some cases, you don't even need a tropical storm. You don't even, it doesn't even need to have a name in order for you to dump enormous amounts of water, especially when you live in the tropics. Thanks. And uh, let me just ask one last quick question. I asked Ryan to follow up on something. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa said when she was talking about a lack of zoning and not being problematic. The one thing that brought to mind is that, um, you know, to, to some degree, don't insurance companies kind of do a little bit of this? Like, if you want flood sure. insurance, you're going to have to do certain things. So not having a private entity in there kind of creates some problems like this, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a distinction between zoning and building codes, sure. which uh, are different questions. Texas does not have a statewide building code, and local building codes differ. Uh, Florida has very strong statewide building codes, um, and, and particularly strong in the South Florida region, which in... I, in this most recent so storm seems to have held up relatively recently. I, uh, I can imagine the Cato Institute does, ha, might have different thoughts about building codes than, than I do. Um, but for, as a for instance, there, is, uh, uh, there, there, there have been proposals that we've put forward and, and, and our partners about things like uh, the Stafford Act. Uh, in, in following a disaster, the federal government picks up a, a set share, state governments pick up a set share of, of the recovery costs. We think there should be some acknowledgement of what are state responsibilities. Uh, we think that they can include things like building codes. They can also include things like properly funding your emergency responders, um, having levy and flood control uh, structures in place, um, and that if you do those things, you get more of the state money, the federal money. If you do not do those things, then it's more on, 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 on the state itself. 